The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 1. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness to our God. Now look at verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. The God of truth and without iniquity, just and right, is he. Here we have what's called a song, many songs throughout the Bible, and obviously giving praise unto Jehovah, and he is the rock, the rock of our salvation. He's the rock, his work is perfect. The Bible says in verse 13 of Deuteronomy 32, he made him right on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields and made him to suck honey out of the rock and out of the flinty rock. Verse 15, But Yeshurun waxed fat and kicked, and thou art waxen fat. Art thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Has that happened to you? Once he prospered you, and now you have money? Have you turned your back on God? Verse 18, Of the rock that beget thee, thou art mine unmindful one that beget thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Verse 30, how should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up, for their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges, comparing their rock with our rock. There's a lot of them out there outside the will of God that have a rock, and that rock's going to fail them. Look at verse 37. And they shall say, Where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted? Psalm 40, verse 2, it says, He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. Amen. That's what God does. He doesn't put you on the shifting sand. He establishes you upon the rock. Psalm 18, verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who's worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. David calls the Lord his strength. God must empty you to fill you. Amen. That's not easy, but he must reduce you to where you're enabled and not able at all, incapable of accomplishing that which you intended to accomplish. You need to understand the work is the Lord. We're simply in his field. He's the one that builds his kingdom. I don't. He doesn't put that in my hands. And so the Bible says he called him his strength. God must sent to you. He called him his rock. How many rocks do you have? Let me tell you something about a rock. It's not a stone. A stone is cut from a rock. We'll get into that in a little while. But there's the rock of Sinai. What rock is that? That's where you go to the top of the mountain and are hidden the cleft of the rocks. Ever approached near enough into God to where you knew you needed something about you? You ever got that close to God? The rock of Horeb. That's when he said, I'll stand upon the rock, smite it. And you can have water from that rock. Yes, water is a type of the Holy Ghost of God. Then there's the rock of ages. From everlasting to everlasting, there's only been one Savior, only ever will be one Savior. There's only one that can carry your sins away. He's the rock of ages. He called him his fortress. You defend your position. What does that mean? A fort is built to defend. And so Psalm chapter number 91, Satan quotes the Bible. Think about that for a moment. You have the scripture come into your heart. The word of God is moving in your soul. And you say, this must be the voice of God. Not necessarily. You need to learn enough of God's word to test and try the spirits. He quoted the Bible to the, to, to the Lord Jesus. Satan did. Psalm 91. He wanted the Lord Jesus to act presumptuously on the word of God. To make a claim on something that was not his to claim at that time. And I'll leave it right there. But that, my friend, is the word of God. Deliverer. The Bible says that we are sanctified, set apart 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the process. Sanctification is not a one event thing. It's a whole lifetime of the work of the Holy Spirit moving in your soul, tearing you from this world and drawing you to Christ. Then he said, he's my God, not Molech, not Baal, not Ashtoreth, not Dagon, not Shemash, not all the gods of this world who've sold their children for a moment of pleasure, who've sold their prosperity, their posterity into the future for the present gain. This is a country that is a bloody country with a blood of 63 million babies on their hands. Never forget that. And it will give an account to Almighty God. And he's buckler. What's that? That's to gird about with the truth. What is the truth? It is either absolute or it's not truth. You live in a generation of relative truth. This is my truth, they say. That's garbage. It is either absolute truth or it is not truth at all. The truth for me is the truth for you. Not your truth, his truth, the truth. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He called him the horn of my salvation. What does that mean? The altar there at the tabernacle was square and it had horns on every corner of it. And if you wanted to plead for the mercy of God, you ran to that altar and took hold of the horns of the altar. There you gave yourself to God and you said, Lord, here is your strength. I'm weak, I'm pleading, I'm begging for you to be merciful to me. You took hold of God's strength to yield in your weakness. That's what he said. He's the horn of my salvation. Then finally he said, he is my high tower. What is a high tower? It is what you use to watch and pray. We should not bury our head within the sand. We live in a generation that is entertained. They don't think, they are amused. So what does that word mean? Most folks don't really understand what it means. Muse, the word muse means to think, to study, to apply your mind. Amuse means to not think, not study, not apply your mind. To sit in a passive state before a computer screen or a theater and let it pass before you, therefore control you my high tower. Psalm 61 verse 2 said, From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, to lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I can take hold of that rock. Yeah, that rock that is higher than I. Amen. If as high as you ever look as man, you're not looking. If as high as you ever look as yourself, you don't know what to see. You've got to lift your eyes above men. You've got to lift your eyes above self. You've got to look to the rock from whence you were hewn. You were cut from that rock. The very breath of God is why you're here right now. There's nothing in the Bible that says God ever breathed into an angel, but he breathed into you. You have, my friend, a future that no angel has, no cherubim, no seraphim, no Satan, no devil, no demon. You have a future that is above all the creation. There's only one above you, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 61, a rock that is higher than I. This rock was smitten, John 4, verse 13. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again to the woman at the well. They must constantly be refreshed, refilled. On and 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 on. They get around each other because they have the same spirit, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. They feed off of each other. It comes from being around and around and around. But if you've got the Holy Ghost in you, you don't need what they got. Amen. He is in you. And he'll stay in you till the day he calls you from this world. It'll be a river rising up inside your soul. Hallelujah to God. A river, not a spring, not a creek, but a river. The flowing of the Holy Ghost of God. The Bible said in John 7, 37, that last day, the great day of the feast, he stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come at unto me. That's a, that's, a, that's a general gift, a general call. Are you thirsty today? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you sick and tired of your hypocritical self? Haven't you had enough of garbage yet? When will you come to yourself slopping with the hogs? When will you come to the time when you come to yourself? That's what the Bible says about him, you know. He came to himself. You know what our biggest problem is? We're hunting for our identity. Who am I? Where did I come from? What am I? 
young people grow up and they're constantly have they they've got this great thing they're following or they have this great hero this icon this one and they want to be like them they wear their clothes they talk like them they look like them they want to be everything about them why because they don't know who they are until you find out who you are then my friend you have an identity problem and men have identity problems well listen to this he said he'll be a the, he'll believe in me the scripture said of his belly shall flow rivers of living water this spake he of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive for the holy ghost was not yet given because that jesus was not yet glorified did you know what that word give means it means the one who has been sent do you realize the lord jesus christ in the book of hebrews is called the apostle of our salvation what does that mean to be an apostle preacher it means a sent one when God sent Christ into this world, he sent him for a purpose, he sent him for a ministry, and he accomplished what God intended for him to do. When the Lord Jesus Christ went back to the right hand of the Father, he sent the Holy Ghost. And he sent the Holy Ghost with the message and power of what he had already accomplished when he was here upon the cross. He was the sent one in the place of the sent one. He said, I must go for the comforter must come. And when he has come, he'll not testify of himself. He'll speak of me. He'll glorify the risen Lord Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. If you want to know if the power of the Holy Ghost of God, hear the name of Jesus. If he's not being preached, you've got the wrong ghost. But if the Lord Jesus is exalted and magnified, lifted up, you've got the Holy Ghost. Amen. And without him, there's nothing but death. Every ghost leads to death. That's what a ghost is. He's nothing but walking death. But our Lord Jesus Christ is arisen, the sent one. And now the Father, through the Son, hath sent another one. And my friend, he'll said, I'll come again. And he will come again. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it's a beautiful thing here. Don't you look at this. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4, And did all drink that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. Now turn with me. I want you to read this yourself to Numbers 21, verse 16. And I believe you'll find the Bible commenting on that scripture. Here's the commentary on the Bible. The Bible comments on itself. You realize that? In Numbers 21, verse 16, And from thence they went to beer. That is the well whereof the Lord spake. And that word beer, by the way, in Hebrew means well. And from thence they went to beer. That is the well whereof the Lord spake to Moses. Gather the people together, and I will give them water. Now watch this. He's going to gather them together, and they're going to get water. Here. Now this is not standing on the rock and smiting the rock and the water coming from the rock. This is another occasion. This is what the Apostle Paul is referring back to in the Old Testament, 1 Corinthians 10. Now look at this. Gather the people together, and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song. My, my, my. It's amazing how much what happens when people begin to sing. They sang this song, spring up a well, sing ye unto it. The princes digged the well, the nobles, now watch this. The nobles digged it by the direction of the lawgiver with their what? Not with picks and shovels. Digging wells is hard work. What they do, they just took their stave and moved it around in the ground a little bit and up came the water. You know why? Because that water was following them. That water was Christ. The rock was following them. And all they had to do was stop and start singing. Amen. We've been singing in here today. We haven't been moaning. I hope you haven't been. I hope if you came in moaning and groaning that you go out singing and praising God. Amen. Because there's one bad thing about being moaners and groaners. You start moaning and groaning yourself. Amen. You get around somebody that's got a dead, de de defeated, negative attitude and you're going to first thing you're going to know you're going to be full of dead and defeat and negativity listen folks the sun will come up the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings he said if i go away i'll come again to receive you to myself a better day is coming amen so the bible says in psalm 78 verse 15 he clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths you know, they just discovered that underneath the surface of the earth is more water than on the surface of the earth. That's quite a remarkable thing. The Bible talks about the deep breaking up and the heavens were breaking up. And the scripture teaches, if you get into it, it teaches that there's a vast amount of water above us. And when God opened the heavens and the rains began to come down for 40 days, they filled this earth until it covered Everest, 29,029 feet. And my dear friend, the only thing that survived was that ark. The ark was lifted up when judgment came. The ark arose. The ark of Moses, the ark of Noah, and the ark of the covenant. They all represent God's saving power. And it rose. 
above the judgment. Hallelujah to God. And then God let them sit on top of that mountain. He put a bowl on the clouds. We were down there in St. Augustine just a few days ago. I was sitting on the back porch looking out, and I'm telling you the truth. I'm in the house of God. The rains had come, and there was nothing like watching rain over an ocean. But my dear friend, here came a bowl, beautiful bowl. I thought, my, what a wonderful thing. Hold on. There's another one right above it. Two bowls rising up in the sky. It's two rainbows. You know what I think every time I see that bowl? I do not think of perversion. Oh, I think of a covenant-keeping God. I'm telling you again, I'll never destroy it with water again. Amen. So, he tells them, I will stand upon the rock at Horeb. Thou shalt smite the rock. There shall come out of it that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. That rock is a picture of the Holy Ghost of God. The Holy Ghost of God could never have been given the way he is given, except it come through the brokenness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had to live a sinless, perfect life and die as a man upon a cross. And because of that, he opened the gates of heaven and no my, no way, my friend, no way could that have happened except through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now to the church, Christ is the rock of the foundation. Matthew 16, he said, I say unto thee, thou art Peter. And upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The name Peter in Greek is Petros. Petros, it means a stone. We're getting the stone a little while. That's what it means, a stone. Now stones can come in varying sizes, but that's what Petros means. But then he said, upon this rock I'll build my church. The word rock is Petra. Now I've been to Sela Petra. It's quite a remarkable place. It's the red stone city. We stayed one night before we went the next day and all the hills about us were red. I just stood in awe. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Everywhere I looked was red hills all over the place. Then we gathered the next morning and we went through what's called the Seek. The Seek is just a very narrow passage with huge boulders on either side. And then when you finally approach close enough, you see what's called the Treasury. Carved into the side of solid rock is one of the most beautiful things on earth. The Nebetean Arabs were the ones who built it. But there you are with this huge Petra, this rock formation carved into it. That's not Petra, it's a stone. That's Petra, a boulder, a cliff, a mountain of stone. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I see it there, Peter, Petra, a stone. But this rock is where I'll build my church. Stones are cut out of the mountains. Think about that for a minute. Stones are cut out. He didn't build his church upon a stone. He built it upon in Ephesians 2.20, he's called the chief cornerstone. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. What's that mean? That means everything else depends upon the alignment, position, and foundation of that stone. Get it off one little bit, and none of the rest of it will be right. We are about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is absolutely the absolute life and soul of this being. This church is nothing without the Son of God. Yeah, I am as insignificant and useless and meaningless, and my life has no meaning without the Lord Jesus Christ whatsoever. I am what I am by the grace of God. I owe everything that I am or ever will be to the Son of God. We are about the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I came knowing nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. Preach Christ, he said, and Him crucified. The Lord Jesus says this, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. You go in the average church in America and you'll hear the ministry lifted up. You'll hear the preacher lifted up. You'll hear the building program lifted up. You'll hear the past, the history lifted up. You'll hear everything in the world lifted up but Christ. And I'm going to tell you right now, every time you lift them up, it goes down. Christ is our life, what we live for. Romans 9, verse 32. The first advent of Christ, he was the stumbling block to the Jew because they sought it by, not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, I lay in Sion, a stumbling stone, rock of offense, and whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. They couldn't get around him. They couldn't push him out of the way. He absolutely hindered their movement, and he intended to. They had the truth. Romans said the oracles of God were given to the Jews. The Old Testament is as inspired as ever word of that New Testament. There are, it's just one Bible, 66 books. One Bible, inspired of God. And so... He was a stumbling stone. Nothing they could do about it. The Lord Jesus Christ says, have you not read the scripture? Have you not read it? But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block to the Greeks foolishness. 
Is what the second advent, the Lord Jesus becomes the headstone. Now look at Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 7. Who art thou, O great mountain? A mountain represents a kingdom. Stone cut out of a mountain smites the image on its feet. In plain words, a kingdom issues forth a stone. Christ is a stone in this case. Smites the image on its feet. So he says here in Zechariah 4, 7, Who art thou, O great mountain? Look at this. Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. See that? From a mountain to a plain. Your kingdom's going to be taken away from you. You're going to lose it. Look carefully at the Bible. Daniel 2, verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image of on his feet. There were iron and clay that were iron and clay and break them to pieces. This is the image of 606 B.C. In the plains of Dura, the image of Nebuchadnezzar that represented the Gentile kingdoms all the way down to the present day. He told him what was going to happen. A stone cut out of a mountain, cut out without hands. To unbelievers, Christ is the rock. The church, Christ the church is a crushing, to unbelievers, Christ the rock is a crushing stone of judgment. You don't hear this read much today in the modern church, but here's what it says in the Bible. Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's us called a nation in the book of Peter. The Bible says, a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. I fell on it in 1973. It broke me. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Amen. It broke me. Praise God. That's why I'm up here yelling at you this morning. That's how I got up here. I didn't start out seeking this. I started out completely separate, opposite direction from God, but God. The difference between the rock and a stone. So what are we talking about? They're both made of the same substance. But what's the difference? Rock is made of mineral water and stone, whereas stone is cut from rock itself. So when you see the word stone, think of cut. Think of the fact that the stone has been cut from the rock, been taken from it. A rock is fixed by the Creator. It's a reference point. It's named. In the Old Testament, there are many rocks that have a name attached to them. A stone, though, is movable with a ministry, a specific use. Cut by the master mason, we are stones, every one of us. Queried from the earth, that's where he came to get us, from the earth. He said, I am from above, ye are from beneath. Cut from the rock. Who does the cutting? God does the cutting. Why did he cut you from the rock? He cut you from the rock to put you in the building. He's building a house, a habitation of the Lord with the Spirit. He's got a place next for the next one of you that gets cut from the rock. There's a place waiting for you right now. And I can't fit in it. Nobody else can fit in it. It's only you that will be able to fit in it. He has it designed specifically for you. It's yours. Transported to our final destination. Carried, cut, and then taken to the final destination. Where's that? The Holy Ghost is the one Christ builds his church. He puts you in that wall. He's building a habitation of God, the Spirit. He places you in that wall. You mean to tell me, preacher, that if God saves my soul, he puts me in the body of Christ, and ain't no man can stop it? You got that right. You got that right. Men have no say so in it. Hallelujah to God. So I'm transported to my final day. You're not done. Then he covers me with wood of his humanity. There I am, covered with sheet and wood. There I am in that wall, and now I'm covered with humanity. What's the humanity represent? It represents his relationship to me. There is that gold on the outside, but the gold doesn't touch the stone. The gold touches the wood. The wood touches the stone. It is through his humanity, it is through the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, that I have access to pure deity, that I have access to God. I cannot touch, I can no more touch God than a cherubim can touch him. I could no more approach into the presence of that almighty, absolute, eternal being. I would be consumed in a heartbeat. Christ can, because that's where he came from. And so that humanity covers me. But that's, he doesn't finish it. Then he's sealed with that gold. Pure gold. When he walks into his temple, his tabernacle, he walks in there, he doesn't see stone. He doesn't see wood. He sees gold. Pure gold. Gold in the Bible represents deity. So what does he see? He sees the deity of Christ. 
He sees the one who's exalted to the right hand of the Father. That's what he sees, and that's all he sees. And when he walks in, he sees that. He walks into this building. He walks down that aisle. Now, if you're not living for God, you want to show him your humanity. Maybe you'd like to show him your accomplishments. Maybe you'd like to show him how great you are in your religious circles, and how wonderful, and all the accolades they've hung around your neck, how great you are. You understand? The apostle says, we're nothing. God, help me, cover me, cover me, wash me in his blood, and cover me with his gold. Cover me, sealed with the gold of Christ's finished work. You'll never have peace. You'll never have victory. You'll never have a walk with God until you accept this one simple fact. I don't care how well-meaning you are. I don't care how many commandments you've got. You've got them all written down. You've memorized every one of them. I don't care how much people approve of your so-called righteous life. I don't care how great you think you are. Some of you in this house today don't think you've sinned in a week. Some of you don't think you've sinned in a... Some of you don't think you've sinned in a month. Some of you don't think... You know, you say, well, not me, man. Not me. I'm sanctified. I'm separated. Well, how do you know? Well, somebody told me I was. <laughs> I mean, how else would you know it? And on and on and on and on and on it goes. The only righteousness that matters, and righteousness is a big word in the Bible. I'll finish with this, but please, I need to tell, tell you again because you don't hear it. The only righteousness that matters anywhere is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ was lived out on this earth for 33 and a half years. A perfect man in perfect obedience unto God Almighty established a righteousness that did not exist. And that righteousness by that sinless perfect life is how he approached Almighty God and was accepted into his presence. Sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that Christ is made unto us righteousness. He is my righteousness, not my good works. And so if I take my last breath on this earth, and I will, we all will, if the Lord doesn't come back, you better believe I will not say, Lord, you know, I preached for, I preached for 50 years for you. No, forget that garbage. There are people out there preach for 60 years and don't know the Lord. What will you say to him? I'll say, Jesus, you're my Savior. You're my Lord. You're my God. My hope, my salvation, my high tower, my buckler, my strength. You're my Lord. You're my God. I trust thee and thee I believe. Lord, take me by the hand and lead me across Jordan. Carry me into the presence of Almighty God. I leave this world in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless your word. Bless it in Jesus' name. For his sake I pray. Also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.